Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming this evening. I'm George Shackelford, Deputy Director of the Kimball Art Museum, and we're happy to welcome you here for a lecture in conjunction with our exhibition, The Lure of Dresden, Bellotto at the Court of Saxony, which, as you know, uh, brings together in uh, Fort Worth for the first time a major group of paintings by Bernardo Bellotto, the great Venetian painter who, uh, as you're going to hear this evening, uh, became celebrated through the courts of Europe. I am happy to introduce this evening Edgar Peters Bowron, whom we all know as Pete, um, who grew up in Birmingham and went to Colgate College and NYU to get his PhD. Um, he worked at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, the Walters Art Gallery, the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, before becoming the director of the North Carolina Museum of Art and then subsequently the director of the Harvard Art Museums in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He took then a position at the National Gallery of Art as chief curator before coming to Texas for his first uh, and quite wonderfully long visit in Houston, where he was curator from 1996 until his retirement uh, in 2014. He is the world's acknowledged expert on the great Italian, Italian, not Re Italian 18th century painter Pompeo Batoni. Um, he has done also uh, major exhibitions, including Art in Rome in the 18th century in Houston, con all of these in Houston, um, co-organized with the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Bernardo Bellotto and the Capitals of Europe, co-organized with the Museo Correr in Venice, a wonderful exhibition um, for all who love uh, pets, Best in Show, The Dog in Art from the Renaissance to Today, which was both very serious and a lot of fun, uh, co-organized with the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, uh, an exhibition about Pompeo Batoni, The Prince of Painters in 18th Century Rome, organized with the National Gallery in London, Antiquity Revived, the Neoclassical Art of the 18th Century, organized with the Louvre, and finally, um, Titian and the Golden Age of Venetian Painting, which brought masterpieces from the National Gallery of Scotland to the High Museum, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and the MFA Houston. Um, I am reminded that he has acquired during his career works by many, many great artists, including Bellotto, Canova, Chardin, Courbet, Gérard, Hausam, Panini, Rembrandt, Rainey, Rysdale, and Turner. So uh, a, a quite a wonderful uh, list of great acquisitions. And I would ask you please to welcome to the podium Pete Bowron. Thank you, George. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I haven't uh, lectured at the Kimball in a number of years, but I did come up for the opening of this remarkable exhibition. And it's really a wonderful, wonderful exhibition that I hope you will spend uh, lots of time in. The, uh, I came here for the opening, heard the very nice symposium, and uh, spent a lot of time in the exhibition, uh, in part listening and talking to your wonderful uh, docent corps. So I uh, uh, urge you to spend as much time as possible in there. I'd also like to thank the Kimball staff, especially Catherine Stevens, for their help in organizing this, uh, this, this lecture. Um, one of the characteristic aspects of 18th century Europe, European art is what art historians call a view painting, a view. Uh, when, we, when you hear the word view, people talk about a view or a view painting. We're talking about a painting, drawing, or print uh, that represents a town uh, landscape or a townscape that is largely topographical in conception. Now, you're looking at a slide of Venice, which is one of the most densely urban environments ever created. It was the birthplace of the veduta, which is the Italian word for view and the home of its, uh, of its main uh, innovators. Uh, beginning with the topographical incidents in the religious pictures of the Bellini family and Vittorio, Vittore Copaccio in the 15th century, 
uh, Venice nurtured a steadily, and here you're looking at a painting by Giovanni and uh, Gentili Bellini, the St. Mark preaching, uh, which is today in the Brera Museum. Uh, Venice understandably nurtured a widening, uh, steadily widening stream of uh, view painters, culminating with uh, Antonio Canaletto, whose career and prolific output over some four decades of activity uh, have become synonymous with what comes to mind when you hear the word view painting. Uh, I'm here you're looking at his view of the, uh, the Bacino uh, <coughs> di San Marco in Venice of about 1738. I think it's his best, it's his greatest picture in America in the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, Boston. Yet among the view painters uh, of the 18th century, uh, none possessed a wider range or attempted to enrich the uh, conventions of the painted veduta more than Bernardo Bellato. He used to be dismissed as merely an acolyte of his uh, famous uncle, and yet, as you've seen, for those of you who've gone into the exhibition, um, he is a, uh, he's astonishing for the breadth of his talent as a landscape painter, as an architectural painter, and a topographical view painter. Um, he was born in, uh, he, was, he was born, here's another picture, oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Here's, here's a Bellato. This is a picture of about 1743 that is in the, um, that is in uh, Castle Howard in Yorkshire. Um, he was born in 1722. He was the son of Canaletto's uh, eldest sister, Fiorenza, and Lorenzo Bellato. And around 1735, at the age of 13, he entered the studio of Canaletto. His apprenticeship with his uncle lasted until the early 1740s, and he thoroughly, understandably, assimilated his, method, his master's methods and style. Uh, he emulated his, his compositions, namely the views of Venice, which you're looking at here. Um, in this instance, he's utilizing a, con a compositional drawing by Canaletto in the uh, Royal Collection. So if you look, d don't look at the uh, foreground with all of the marine uh, maritime activity, but just look at the composition, and you can see how, understandably, this child, he's still a young boy in the early 40s, um, is, uh, is depending on his master's uh, uh, work. Um, by 1740, he was actually assisting Canaletto uh, in the production of view paintings. And for the longest time, and maybe still today, people argue about um, which is by Bellato and which is by, uh, by Canaletto. But, uh, and it probably can never be uh, established with precision. And even his contemporaries uh, couldn't easily identify his uh, uh, earliest individual manner. His first biographer, Pietro Guarini, asserted that, quote, his scenes of Venice were so carefully and so realistically done that it was exceedingly difficult to distinguish his work from his uncle's. And what the picture that you're looking at is a view of the Campo di Santi, Santi Giovanni e Paolo in Venice, picture of about 1743 to 47. It's in the National Gallery of Art. And um, it was, um, it was, it's now accepted by Bellotto in spite of there's no absolutely uh, conclusive evidence, but we see for many, many reasons, if we could actually look at the picture, uh, a number of the elements of his uh, distinct, his bold and distinctive style of painting. Here's another picture um, in the Getty Museum. It's a sweeping view of the Grand Canal with the church of uh, Santa Maria della Salute. It's also about 1743. And it was acquired by the Getty Museum in 1991, as by Canaletto, but it's now recognized as one of his most impressive early, uh, early paintings. There's a pair of Venetian scenes of about the same date in the uh, National Gallery of Canada. I'm showing you one, this one depicting the entrance to the arsenal. The arsenal was a cluster of shipyards and armories that contributed to Venice's power as a maritime, uh, it's, 
it's the city's maritime process, prowess rather, and it also suggests uh, uh, what the early Bellato looked like. In fact, the Italian scholar Teresio Pignati uh, first called attention in, to the Ottawa pictures as exemplifying um, the characteristics that are unmistakably Bellato's own, the exacting precision of architectural line. This, there's a kind of cold crystalline light that you will all still see in the Dresden pictures sharply defined areas of light and shade, and these tall, lanky figures whose facial features are sometimes abbreviated to simple blots. And importantly for the Dresden pictures, these, these pictures are 59 by 48 inches. Um, so it shows us that even at an early age, uh, he was, uh, this artist was uh, very uh, uh, comfortable in composing on a large scale, which is another feature, as you've seen, of the Dresden pictures. In the early 1740s, Bellotto traveled variously on the Italian mainland. He went to, uh, along the Brenta River to Padua, he went to Florence, he went to Lucca, and he went to Rome. And it was during these years that he fully matured as an artist. You're looking at one of my favorite early pictures by the artist, uh, a view of the Tiber River with the Castel San Angelo in Detroit. And during these years, as I say, he matured both as a landscape and as an architectural painter. Um, he gives, it's also interesting in this picture and its pendant, which is in Toledo, uh, also showing the Tiber River and also the Castel San Angelo from another angle. Um, he gives the river great prominence, which reminds us that, uh, as you will see, river landscapes, as you see from the Dresden pictures, are prominent throughout his career. And I think that's probably just the, uh, the effect of growing up in Venice in this watery realm. Here's another one that I'm just showing you because I like it. It's an, actually an imaginary landscape in the Tissen uh, uh, collection in Madrid, also about 1743. But he loves these riverine views, if you will. Here's an, oops, too fast. Here's, he went to Verona and uh, they were the largest uh, in about 14, 1745 to 47. And they were the largest uh, and most ambitious compositions uh, he had uh, created to date. And they really establish a new level of achievement for Bellotto. As one writer put it, from now on, seven feet was to be Bellotto's minimum width for his important townscapes. In itself, surely a mark of self-confidence in a man not 30 years old. And the Verona views were half again as large as his previous canvases, and the horizontal shape uh, provides the format and the, uh, for the panoramic views of Dresden that would become his trademark. Here's another picture, slightly smaller, but it's in Philadelphia, and it also, uh, I'm just, point, just reinforcing this fact. But it's also important to note that he didn't just paint uh, river views or views with water, he responded to the Italian mainland in a way that was much different than his uncle Canaletto. And right from the beginning, he seems to have had a great interest in landscape, which you see in the exhibition. The textures and reflections of stone, of soil, vegetation, and of course water captivated him. And he was absorbed in their particularities in a way that his uncle never was. He, the, I think, to my mind, the most extraordinary of these early uh, of these early Italian landscapes is a view of the village of Gazzada, G-A-Z-Z-A-D-A -Z -Z -A -A in Lombardy um, in the north of Italy. And these, the contrasts of light and shade, the intense color, the transparent atmosphere, and this sensitivity to rural scenery uh, provide a foretaste, particularly of the views of Perna uh, upstairs, uh, on view upstairs in which he would subordinate architecture to a natural view. And uh, I think also the most, another feature, the most remarkable feature of these early pictures is his handling of light, um, his use of color to reproduce precisely the hues he had observed in the open air. It almost appeared to anticipate the interests 
uh, if not the methods, of the plain air painters who roamed Italy later in the uh, 18th century, painting out of doors <coughs> rather than in the studio. In July of 1747, in response to an official invitation from the court of Dresden, Bellotto left Venice forever. Somebody asked me the other day about where is Dresden. Well, here you see a map of, of uh, the modern Federal Republic. So you, just to orient yourself, here's Munich, here's Berlin. Berlin's, it's about two hours on the train to Dresden. So it's a, a wonderful trip. And I should have said that Dresden is one of my favorite cities in the entire world, and the Dresden Picture Gallery is also um, something that is not to be missed by any art lover. But I just, just wanted to orient, uh, orient you there. Uh, in 1694, the accession to the throne of Frederick Augustus II, the Elector of Saxony, inaugurated the most brilliant era in the history of the city and it became a major European capital with his election as King of Poland in 1697. Augustus the Strong, who you see here in a painting by Nicholas de Largelier in Kansas City of about 1715, um, Augustus the Strong, as he was known, was not a uh, pleasant man, either in appearance or behavior. He was ruthless, self-indulgent, corrupt, and an uncontrolled womanizer. Gosh, that sentence has, an un, has a contemporary ring to it. Um, <laughs> physically, he was, uh, he was endowed with enormous strength, thus his name, Augustus the Strong. It was said that he could bend fireplace pokers and horseshoes um, with ease. But he had a vision for his land and his dynasty that was to transform the Saxon capital architecturally, artistically, and culturally in the first half of the 18th century to the degree that it was christened, uh, that Dresden was christened for its great beauty as, by, as Florence on the Elba by the German writer Johann Gottfried Herder. The building program of the, uh, of the elector and his son in the first half of the 18th century produced some of the most elegant and uh, Baroque and Rococo buildings in Europe, notably Matthias uh, Daniel Koppelmann's uh, Zwinger, Zwinger pavilions, his reconstruction, sorry, his reconstruction of the, uh, of the beautiful stone bridge crossing the Elba, known as the Augustus Bridge or Augustus Bruca. Uh, Georg Baer's Frauenkirche that you see here, here's the bridge. Um, and the Catholic Church of the Royal uh, Court of Saxony uh, by uh, Gaetano Chiaveri, which is also known as the Hofkirche. Um, all were prominent, are, these are all prominent features of Bellotto's paintings in the exhibition. And, it's important to underscore their celebrity and status of these new buildings in the 18th century. His uh, greatest architectural, Augustus' greatest architectural legacies were the Zwinger and the Frauenkirche. The Zwinger was an exuberant piece of architecture that was as elaborate, as, elaborate sorry, as anything built in Europe in the day. It's essentially, as you'll see in a moment, uh, a, it's essentially an open space surrounded by fortified walls. The original concept was relatively simple. An orangery with low curved uh, galleries adjoining the royal palace. All the surfaces were decorated with rich Baroque sculpture, the finest being the work of uh, Balthazar Permoser, which you see here. Uh, they're all themes from nature in the form of fountains, satyrs, nymphs, uh, figures from classical antiquity, puti, together with the dynastic uh, coat of, coats of arms to emphasize the elector's, uh, the elector's authority. And although he was by now a Catholic, Augustus' second major work in the city was the great Protestant Frauenkirche, the Church of Our Lady. The church was designed with remarkable boldness for the confined area of its site, the Neumarkt or the New Marketplace. 
the uh, cramp space being turned uh, to advantage. You see the four towers uh, presenting the same image from uh, any direction. But its size, its brilliant and daring uh, handling of interior space, which we can't see, of course, and its huge 352-foot high stone dome formed the spatial and the uh, physical center of the Dresden skyline. And they all made the Frauenkirche arguably the most important uh, pure Protestant, uh, pure Baroque Protestant building. Also, it's important to note that under uh, Augustus, Dresden had become a city of 40,000 people and a major European capital with a court renowned for its uh, splendor. It was, however, Augustus' son, Frederick Augustus III, who was king of Poland and elector of Saxony. He was uh, a passionate lover of music, the theater, and the visual arts, and the most munificent patron of the arts in Germany of his day. It was he, along with his powerful prime minister, Count Heinrich Brühl, who charged Bellato with creating a record of for posterity of the tangible uh, accomplishments of his father and himself. He's shown here with his, you know, this, these are para paintings in the exhibition. They're actually after, uh, para paintings after Piet by Pietro Rotari, showing the elector and his wife, Josepha, there on the, uh, on the right. I thought when I first saw it a month ago, I thought, gosh, she's not a particularly flattering portrait of her. And then I remembered that she bore the man 15 children, so I think she's <laughs> entitled to look a little peaked, shall we say. Um, but it's important to underscore uh, right from the start that from, 16, from around 1600, there'd been a very strong tradition at the Saxon court for topographical views, accurately representing the towns of, in the duchies of Saxony and Meissen. And the fondness of the successive electors for Vedute is shown by the fact that the court employed a permanent prospect maler, to use the German word, or a painter of prospects or views from the 17th century onward. For example, this view of the Augustus Bridge by the court painter Johann Alexander Thiele, T-H-I-E-L-E, -E, one of several works by the artist in the exhibition painted in 1746. And while I don't want to trash the uh, abilities of Tila, it's, um, I think you can see, in a, in, if you've seen the exhibition, in just in a, in a blink of the eye, uh, why Bellotto was so extraordinarily acclaimed and successful. If you, actually, if you enter the exhibition and you go into the, maybe it's the second gallery, or the third gallery, and there's a spot that you can actually see this picture, and then you can look over at the same view of Bellato's, uh, uh, the same scene, and it's, as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, from the moment of his arrival in Dresden, he stepped dramatically into this role, and he began the task of commemorating the most celebrated sites of Dresden and later in the countryside beyond the city of Pirna and Königstein. Between 1747 and the first months of 1753, he produced 14 large views of Dresden that show the city's Baroque and Rococo buildings to their, to their absolute best advantage. The earliest of these is this view of the city from the right bank of the Elba River uh, above the Augustus uh, Bridge, or Augustus Brucke here. Um, you can see that the dome of the Frauenkirche looms large there. Here's the Catholic Church, uh, the court church that, uh, that we mentioned, and uh, with its unfinished bell tower. But what, I was really, what I'd like to call your attention to that you won't see here, but you will see it in the exhibition, is the way that the boldness and the prominence with which Bellotto has signed his name in full. Bernardo Bellotto, Detto Canaletto. Detto means in Italian called, and Canaletto. Bellotto still capitalized. He's a very young man. He's 25 years old. He's still capitalizing on the fame of his teacher and great, 
great uh, master, uh, Antonio Canaletto. And so you will see the name Cantaletto, or sorry, Canaletto in a I mean, he was known as Cantaletto, as Canaletto often by his contemporaries in Dresden and Vienna, and above all in, in Warsaw. It's also important, he gives the date, and when you look at this, you'll also see that he gives the name of the site in Dresda. It, I didn't mean to do that, I meant to do that. You'll see there also in Dresda, which uh, means in Dresden, and it's the only such example in his Saxon views. And I think what he's really doing here is he, it really shows us that he's aware of this important event in his career, the beginning of a new creative phase and his admission to a major European court. This is underscored by the insertion of himself here uh, with Tila, uh, and I've forgotten which one is Tila and another uh, court artist there. Um, and uh, the following year, he produced a, uh, a, a companion to, to the painting, the much more famous view of, uh, of the famous view of Dresden from the same bank of the Elbe River from a point downstream from the city center. This painting of 1748 is almost a mirror image. You see the Frauenkirche here uh, in the center, the uh, court church dominating the right half of the composition with its, with, with its uh, spire, which actually Bellotto shows unfinished because it was completely unfinished. He's using architectural drawings that he obtained. So this, we're, we're actually seeing what it's going to look like. Uh, the broadband of the foreground is filled with uh, country people, with fishermen, and shepherds who are riding, resting, or strolling along the banks of the river. I'll say a word in, in a moment about the importance of Bellotto's figures uh, generally. The Dresden views, which um, conclude this, this early stage of Bellotto's uh, Italian views and career, they really are astonishing. I look, visited the uh, exhibition this afternoon with a colleague, and, and just, I, know, I don't forget, I know this, but how pleasant, I mean, how, how pleasurable it is and how admiring we are of the topographical precision of the control of light and his ability to, m to manipulate mathematical perspective and the clarity and organization of these pictures. He could manipulate light and shade and he could arrange uh, planes and solids with the ease of a theatrical painter. And let's not forget that he was trained. Uh, his father was a theatrical painter and um, we know that as a young man he was taken to Rome by Canaletto where they produced uh, scenes for operas by, by Scarlatti. But it's this ability to take all of these elements and organize them into a unified, bold, and dramatic uh, design. Size, scale, and breadth of view are just a few of the differences between Bellotto's townscapes and those of Canaletto, and a few of the ways in which the pupil surpassed the, uh, his master. Bellotto's views of Dresden and its uh, environs are not only his finest works, but among the greatest achievements of 18th century view painting. This view of the Zwinger of 1752 was painted like many of the architectural views with the aid of a camera obscura. Now, the camera, uh, a, a German scholar, Helmut, Helmut Fritsche, in 1936 actually measured the projected layout of the painting and the Zwinger itself and found that the cor various corners are not quite straight, they're slightly out of, out of uh, true and concluded that Bellotto actually used a, um, a uh, camera obscura. The camera obscura is, 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 a, is a kind of predecessor of the modern, uh, of the modern, what would we say, photographic camera. It's an apparatus that, that uh, that projects the image of, an of a scene onto a, 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 a paper or a wall. Sometimes it's a room that you enter and you make the rudiments of it, perhaps on the canvas, and the outlines can be traced and transferred to the, uh, out to the format of the, uh, of the canvas. Uh, sometimes it consists, as you see here, of a shuttered box or a room with a small hole or lens, and it projects the image upside down. Uh, from, a, from the brightly lit scene outside, and sometimes, eventually, it, it, uh, 
it advances so that it really becomes a kind of predecessor of the modern photographic camera. But the optical principle is very much the same, and many 18th century view painters, including Canaletto, uh, amateurs and professionals alike, used this device in the 17th and 18th century. Of course, we associate it with uh, Johannes Vermeer and Dutch 17th century painting as well. Between uh, 1753 and the spring of 1756, Bellotto was assigned by the Saxon court to paint 11 views of the rural, small rural town of Pirna. It's roughly 10 miles southeast of Dresden. And this led to a proliferation of pastoral motifs and life in his work. In several of these paintings, including this one, the imposing fortress of Sonnenstein, you see it here, is uh, rising above the town of Pirna, is present. And it is the principal subject of three of the views, which suggests that the king wanted to spotlight the strategic significance of the castle. Uh, Bellotto's views of Pirna emphasize, as I said, the town's um, uh, pastoral surroundings, the river valley, vineyards, fields, and meadows. And when you look at these pictures, um, poke your noses in them and look, and you'll see there's a man trimming trees. There's some people working in the vineyard various other rural motifs. Here on the other side, we see the town itself with its various activities, a stone quarry, these rafts which would carry the material, and so forth. Um, and uh, this is one of the most exciting views uh, in the exhibition of, of Pirna and of the fortress. It's, a, it's an odd view of the port of the fortress uh, shown in the evening from a, from a different angle. The realism is even more pronounced in the vignettes of the uh, everyday life even more uh, prominent. And I should say that the, we know as a fact that some of these, I can't remember whether it's this goat or these two sheep uh, or this cow, were taken directly from prints by the 17th century Dutch artist Nicholas Berkham. Um, but from this point forward, look at the size of the uh, at the size of the, the prominence of the figures, and particularly in the Pirna pictures, uh, we, Bellotto's figures become an increasing uh, important and an increasingly significant feature of his, uh, of his work, uh, many of which can be assigned to a specific professional and social standing by their appearance and dress. And as I said, you know, one of the pleasures of looking at these paintings is to actually look at these figures and see them and try to figure out what they are doing. For example, this man urinating against the wall here. Uh, it's not, I'm guessing that the number of public conveniences in Pirna in 1755 was a rather small number. And I don't think it has, somebody was asking me about this, I don't think it has any significance other than just to underscore this is what his viewers knew, uh, the, the, what the court knew. This is life in a small town. Uh, but it's fascinating to actually look at, uh, at these pictures and, um, and look at these genre or these scenes from everyday life, because it's, it's part of the pleasure of, of these works. In the spring of 1756, Bellotto was commanded to focus his efforts on the portrayal of another royal castle, Königstein, uh, even further southeast of Dresden. He eventually produced uh, five uh, views of this ancient fortress, executed on canvases of identical size and format, and they were intended to, to uh, complete the Dresden and Pirna pictures and to hang in the royal uh, collection, the royal picture gallery. The most notable of these five views is this view in Washington, which, is, which shows the great fortress of Pirna. But his progress in working on, the, um, on these Königstein views was abruptly interrupted when Frederick the Great and, uh, of Prussia opened hostilities in the Seven Years' War by invading Saxony in uh, August 1756. And the siege and occupation of Dresden presented, prevented the works from ever being uh, from ever going into the royal collection. You know, all, all were within in England within a few years of their, uh, 
<coughs> of their being completed. Uh, this was acquired by the National Gallery in, I think, 1994. The National Gallery in London just acquired a, another view of Pirna. Two are in Manchester. So that leaves, I think there's one left on the market, should you be interested. Um, <laughs> in the winter of 1758 to 59, when Dresden was occupied by the Prussians, Bellotto moved to Vienna, um, where he remained until early 1761. There he painted 13, again, the same size as the Dresden pictures, 13 large canvases of the principal attractions of the city for Empress Maria Theresa. They largely emphasize her palaces, such as you see here, uh, the Palace of Schönbrunn, uh, or buildings uh, constructed at her behest, and they represent the second great portrayal of a, uh, the second great series uh, devoted to the portrayal of a single city and its environs. But here, there's even a more marked increase in, that we saw in the, in the Pirna pictures uh, in the, this increase in realism. Um, it's accomplished both through a scrupulous and almost objective treatment of architectural detail, but also um, an observant representation of, of everyday human life and activity. In, in this picture, he captures in great detail the street life in the center of Vienna, depicting objectively the various social classes and groups conducting their daily business. And um, while Canaletto revealed a sharp eye for the minutiae of daily life in his views of Venice, Bellotto's dedication to, in recording the throngs of aristocrats and peasants, noblemen and servants, monks and Jews, tradesmen and beggars, suggests an almost obsessive interest in reportage. Um, his second period of Dresden, from 1761 to 1766, was marked by financial difficulties caused by the destruction of his house. He lost everything in the bombardment of, by, by the Prussians. And also the deaths of Augustus III and Count Bruhl within a few months of each other in 1763. And then thirdly, the, um, the, a change in the direction of the artistic affairs of the Saxon court in favor of uh, native artists, uh, native Saxon-born artists. And this was a tough time for him. In order to eke out a living, uh, he served as the equivalent of a tutor in, the, in perspective uh, at the Dresden Academy of Fine Arts, um, which was recently established in 1764. But also out of economic necessity, he made and sold prints, such as you see here, of his uh, and produced small-scale replicas, which you will see in various museums around the world, of his earlier views of Dresden, Pirna, and Königstein. But he, during this period, here's another one of these prints, but fruit was born from this rather barren period, and he also produced serious uh, work and explored new genres, the most, inc the most imaginative being architectural capriccios or fantasies, and to use the Italian word vedute ideate, that is to say views with purely imaginary elements. Um, now, this picture, which is from the uh, Queen, Queen's College, in, I think it's Queen's College, Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, um, of about 1763 to five, it's pictures like this that link Bellotto to a trans-European trend, uh, a taste across Europe for paintings, drawings, prints with architectural fantasies as their subject. For example, the prints of, of Giambattista Piranesi. And the cultural politics, the changes in patronage, and in artistic theory in Dresden contributed uh, to his uh, this heightened interest in the genre of these inventive architectural fantasies. Um, it's important, I think, also, and I don't want to get too dry here into the weeds, but it's important to remember that in intellectual and academic circles since the Renaissance, the straightforward depiction of, say, a topographical view painting had always been a humble category. In other words, to paint merely what the eye can see and the opinion of the new director of the uh, arts at the Saxon court, a man named Christian Ludwig uh, von Hagedorn, 
uh, sounds ominously like a, like a marching orders for the local artists. Quote, works of art are enhanced only by the beauty of their invention, by which he meant the depiction of what can be imagined, not merely seen, not merely observed by the eye. And as I said, since the Renaissance, uh, intellectuals and theorists uh, and academics had argued that the, that the categories of landscape painting, scenes of everyday life, uh, or genre painting, still life and animal painting were inferior to, say, religious or history painting because they were considered mechanical and inventive, not imaginative. Uh, sorry, they were considered mechanical and imitative, not uh, imaginative or inventive. So. <coughs> Bellotto, being the artist that he did, responded with a number of brilliantly painted architectural capriccios. This might be one of the finest. And they're characterized by these extraordinary um, inventive combinations of Baroque and neoclassical architecture, dazzling perspective effects, and notably this one, as I just mentioned in the exhibition, um, this architectural capriccio with a self-portrait in the costume of a Venetian nobleman. Um, he's, Bellotto has depicted himself in the crimson robes and the golden stole, uh, uh, that is to say, around his neck, of the Venetian nobility. He's uh, standing before a magnificent arrangement of columned uh, arches and colonnaded galleries, and he steps forward with this proud display as if inviting the viewer to behold and um, uh, and admire his latest artistic creation, uh, namely the splendid architecture that he's created behind him that doesn't exist in fact, as proof of his artistic abilities and his um, pictorial imagination. He's uh, aided by his faithful uh, servant Cecco, or Francesco here, and accompanied by an elderly uh, gentleman holding a, a, sh a sheaf of uh, a folder, that man has been variously identified uh, most recently as Pietro Metastasio, the Italian poet and librettist. Um, and at the left, you can just, I'll show you in a moment, you can just see his arm, we'll see it in a moment. He's uh, a, a young peasant boy, uh, there, there where you can just see it there at the left, points to uh, Bellotto as if to encourage us, the viewer, to take particular note of this splendidly dressed painter. Now, the whole f this whole thing has this fantastical, this fantastical architectural setting has the air of a grand theatrical set, as I told you earlier, which Bellotto was trained in. And in fact, the column on the right uh, it, it actually bears uh, several theatrical posters. And also, you can see the words on one of them, a uh, very famous uh, quotation from the Roman poet Hort Horace, ut pictura poesis, which is a Latin phrase literally meaning as, as is painting, so is poetry, which suggests that poets and painters uh, all, work from, uh, all work from their imagination. Um, in other words, this picture was created as a kind of architectural uh, manifesto. You see this extraordinary uh, uh, command of perspective, the way that it recedes deep into the background. Uh, you see segments of buildings, some real, some imaginary, and this, uh, they're all joined one to the other to create this dazzling uh, vistas of stairways, courtyards, porticos, and loges. Here you see the famous, uh, well, you can see here at the top, you see that he's almost brought in architectural motifs such as the Arch of Constantine in Rome. And then this building here that you saw, let's go back just one briefly. You see it's from Jacopo San Savino's 16th century Marciana Library right in the heart of Venice. It's, in other words, what he's, I think what he's doing here is this is a kind of grand theatrical repost or challenge to his Dresden contemporaries. It's almost as if saying, you want invention? I'll show you invention. Um, he also painted, uh, uh, there's another uh, lovely uh, architectural capriccio in the exhibition, this one from the Crest Collection in El Paso. Um, and it, it's fascinating because it shows a powerful, a living, powerful 
uh, Polish nobleman here, Franciszek uh, Selezy Potacki, um, his son Stanislaus, and a retainer who's wearing Polish Cossack uh, uniform. This is a picture in El Paso in the, uh, in the Crest Collection. Um, Potatsky was a wealthy landowner in Ukraine. He was allied with Count Brule, uh, Bellotto's uh, patron, during his first residence in, uh, period of residence in, in, in Saxony, and he, and he Potatsky, often stayed in Dresden. But I'm sure you've noticed here the composition is filled with learned references, notably uh, John Lorenzo Bernini's um, <coughs> famous sculpture in the Borghese Gallery of Apollo and Daphne, and it culminates in this magnificent uh, imaginary but riveting uh, Baroque facade surrounded by a balustrade and a pediment. The other thing that's interesting about these pictures, and it's often, it takes us back to this interest that Bellotto has in genre or his interest in daily life, um, and we see this, the occupations of the nobility and their families, as in Potatsky, his son, and the servant, uh, court officials and others. It wouldn't have been unusual for Bellotto to introduce uh, Poles in their national costumes in the, uh, into his paintings from this period, but completely unexpected. Uh, again, are the humble figures that surround them. You wouldn't expect this in a painting like this of, of this uh, exalted Ukrainian uh, figure. Um, for example, this blind beggar here at the left, uh, a peddler at the right of the entrance selling his wares, uh, a poor man and his family here in the shadow seated on the steps that descend to the palace courtyard. And it's been suggested that, um, that they are intended to refer to the miserable state of the uh, city, city's citizen, citizenry following the bombardment by the Prussians of Dresden in uh, 1760. <clears throat> One of the paintings, I uh, hasten to say, not in the exhibition, but that is most engaging to a 20th century sensibility with a variety of implications is a view of the remains of the old Kreuzkirche one of Dresden's main Protestant uh, churches. Would you mind terribly if I just... Sorry about that. Um, painted in 16, 1765 when the artist had returned to the city after the end of the Seven Years' War. Um, he painted some 15 years earlier, he painted the structure for uh, Augustus III. It's a more or less straightforward architectural depiction emphasizing the monumental facade of the church. But five years after the bombardment of the city by the Prussians in 1760, during which the church was largely destroyed, except for the east wall, that had been shored up by a wooden uh, casing, and it suddenly collapsed on the 22nd of June, 1765. Thus, what we're seeing here is actually, what Bellotto's actually depicting is the demolition of the upright remains of the church. And it's again this dramatic blurring of the boundaries between uh, a painting's topographical and its narrative functions. This view of the ruined church doesn't merely chronicle its destruction in the war, as most people think by the, by the Prussian artillery, but records an actual historical event namely the demolition of the church in early July of that year. It was recorded in the press that a local mason named Kunzelmann offered to undertake the, uh, the dangerous task of dismantling this 300-foot tower brick by brick. And the event was, you see this curious ladder, it was called curious in the press uh, here, and the event was the talk of the town, and I think it's somewhat analogous to what we, and what we see here is comparable to the demolition of the ruins of the World Trade Center. And like the crowd assembled uh, at the foot, you know, looking on here, the, the viewer of the painting also becomes a, an eyewitness to the historical event with the demolition workers climbing the uh, dilapidated structure. <clears throat> Here's a slightly off-color slide, but it's remarkable. You see the, 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 what has collapsed here. You see this ladder. 
looking dangerously precarious, and yet we see this, this mound of rubble um, from the recent collapse, and yet in the foreground, the workers are laying the foundation for uh, a new church. And <clears throat> interestingly, in his quest for accuracy, it was noted at the time that on July 5th, Bellotto himself attempted to climb the structure in order to record the, uh, the scene accurately. And of course, for a modern audience, the, the destruction, uh, the, the image of the destroyed church uh, holds uh, sinister implications, uh, namely the 37-hour allied uh, incendiary bombing campaign uh, beginning on the night of February 13, 1945, which resulted in a firestorm that killed some 25,000 people, mostly civilians, and destroyed 13 square miles of the oldest part of the city, including the Frauenkirche, which you see here, and many other celebrated buildings. The, this painting of the Kreuzkirche uh, has been seen as a prefiguration of German romanticism. For example, Caspar David Friedrich's images of ruined churches. But in fact, what I'd like to underscore here is that Bellotto is working entirely within the pictorial conventions of 18th century townscape painting. He's meticulously recorded a scene that he and hundreds of other citizens witnessed that was reported in the local press, and almost with a miniaturist uh, fidelity and precision of touch. In fact, a much more proto-romantic uh, element in Bellotto's painting is this characteristic view of spatial depths, particularly here, uh, his long, low horizons stretching seemingly infinitely into the distance. The, it's, it's that that appears to have caught the attention of artists like Friedrich. And indeed, I can't show you, I don't have a detail of this, but I would like when you go up to see the exhibitions to, to note particularly this passage here. Just poke your nose in here and look at that. Um, because the provocative comparison exists between this, uh, this view and the background of which shows Dres the towers of Dresden and these two gents, it's almost as if they were calling attention to it. Um, and to which th they seem to point, and Friedrich's uh, fields near Greifswald in a painting of 1820-22 that's in Hamburg today, which suggests that Bellotto's <coughs> naturalism uh, might really indeed have caught the attention of a younger generation of painters. The eerie naturalism of Bellotto's landscape in which selected details uh, possess an almost otherworldly quality, and you will see that in the painting uh, when you look closely at it. And the richness and intensity of his palette anticipate to a remarkable degree uh, the work of G German romantics like Caspar David Friedrich and Ludwig Richter. In December 1766, Bellotto and his son Lorenzo left Dresden um, with the intention of traveling to St. Petersburg to work for uh, Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia, uh, Catherine II. He probably arrived in Warsaw before the end of January 1767, and he was immediately offered employment at the court of the last king of Poland, Stanislaw II, August Poniatowski. He was appointed court painter in 1768 and spent the last 12 years of his life working for the king in relative comfort and security. His most important work uh, from this period is a series of 26 views of Warsaw, which you're looking at here. They were intended for a particular room, which has come down to known to us as the Canaletto Hall. I mentioned that Ballotto was known as Canaletto in the royal castle, and it's a place where courtiers and ministers and others would assemble before being ushered into one of those doors at the end to, to have an audience with the king. The Warsaw views are, have taken this trend of genre that we've discussed and to an even further degree, and they couldn't be more different. Uh, they represent a radical departure from the classical perfection of the Dresden series. They're different in composition, in light, in color, they're animated by a particularly keen response to the inhabitants of the city and its environments. The realistic treatment of the figures, which now take up much more space than in the Dresden or Vienna, Vienna views, 
anticipate, um, they almost, they have a genre quality that really does strongly anticipate uh, 19th century paintings of the urban scene. In this picture, the uh, Church of the Holy Cross in Warsaw, the figures and animals compete for attention with the architecture of the city. The, se the scene is ostensibly dominated by the, um, by, the, uh, by the church on the left, but one's attention is inevitably drawn, particularly if we could see the actual picture, uh, of this, these throngs of merchants, traders, peasants from outlying villages, their carts, their wagons, farm animals filling the square. Here's another, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, annual procession uh, which shows uh, a religious procession in front of the palace of the Republic of Warsaw. This is painted in 1778, two years before Bellotto's death, which shows us uh, this precious statue of, where is she, I think there, of uh, precious statue of the Virgin of Mercy, the patroness of Warsaw being carried through the streets of the city. Um, gone are the uh, anonymous and awkward figures of the Italian period uh, pictures. They've now evolved into a dis diverse and, represent and representative population going about its normal uh, business. At this moment in Bellotto's career, he seems to have purged all uh, traces of, it, of his Venetian origins, and he's given free design, uh, free reign to his desire as an accurate recorder of facts. He literally adheres to what he knows and what he sees or knows to be present. And I think it's right from the beginning, we've seen this current racing all the way through um, the, in the pictures in, the, uh, in this late period that his realism is almost unbridled. Um, no greater proof exists than the fact that the Warsaw pictures by Bellotto were used in the reconstruction of individual buildings and in fact whole, whole uh, quarters of the city after uh, the Second World War. And it's nice, I, this thought just occurred to me that the Dresden pictures are kind of right in the middle of all of these, uh, of all of these tendencies and that's just one of the reasons why we admire them so much and why they're such a pleasure to, to look at over this arc of his career. Here's the boy again. Um, Canaletto and Bellotto never made contact with one another as far as we know after 1746 when the older painter departed uh, Venice for London. But if he could have seen his nephews and his protégés, subsequent paintings, the known the breadth of his pictorial interests, how he expanded beyond his range, beyond traditional view painting, his ventures into genre, portraiture, allegory, history painting, and the, way, the manner in which he anticipated a number of phenomena that we associate with the late 18th and early 19th centuries, plain air painting, romanticism, genre painting, and realism. I often think he, I often imagine that he um, might have felt like the English painter Thomas Gainsborough when reflecting upon the range and diversity of the work of his great rival, Sir Joshua Reynolds. Damn the man, how various he is. Thank you. <laughs>